Okay, so we have Adam with us, and uh, we'd like to welcome you to the show, Adam. And you're out in Alberta, and you're on the show with Timothy and Alexandria. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Not too bad, thank you. How about yourself? We're doing good. And I think, uh, Adam, it's Alexandria here. I'd like to let all of our listeners know that uh, you're Adam Browning and your Métis Nation of Alberta Local 2003 Lethbridge and area Métis. Is that correct? That's correct. Perfect. And I think before we get into uh, you discussing uh, what what the heck is happening in Alberta, and I really think it takes a lot of courage uh, for you to, and I'm reading, I'm referencing your October 31st, 2022 letter to the Prime Minister of Canada. It takes guts and courage to do what you and the other individual in this letter did. And kudos to you for standing up for what you believe is to be right for the Métis people in Alberta. Thank you. You know, if I may, I think that there's a big misconception among Métis leaders in Alberta about what leadership is. You know, to me, I'm a teacher, I'm an educator, and I do this in a volunteer capacity, but it's a privilege in a non-paid capacity I lead my community along with an elected council. And, you know, when we speak about leadership, my council, we don't just talk about Métis rights, we talk about Métis responsibilities. And I know that there is some trepidation and there's some fear about people speaking up about, you know, concerns of the governance of this proposed constitution, but that's who we are. We're rooted in speaking truth to power. And so my council is big about that and so am I. And so we haven't hesitated, we've tried to see where we could work with other leaders in the Métis Nation of Alberta or other Métis leaders towards bettering our communities. When we've hit, you know, some some barriers when it comes to this proposed constitution and being involved, we've tried to have conversations before we've taken actions. But when we haven't gotten anywhere, we've been fairly decisive about, you know, what our next steps are, and that's to speak out and to call this what it is. Um, and when we tried to do that with the MA leadership, we didn't get enough responsiveness, and so we really weren't left with any recourse other than to approach the federal government directly to say that we got some serious concerns. And you know what, Adam? Uh, we had serious concerns. We've heard a lot of serious concerns from a lot of m a citizens who reach out to us and they talk to us, and, and we spend hours and hours a week listening to complaints that people have uh, that's members of the m a and the thing is that when we reach out to the m a we don't over the years uh it's, you get you get silence and that's one of the biggest complaints that people have is there's silence there and we were looking forward to change in alberta I, I don't know how you felt about it but i know us personally hearing everything that we heard we were looking forward to this last election that got pushed back and uh that was very I think that the reason, my personal opinion, I'm just going to give my opinion here. I believe that Audrey knew she was not going to be reelected, and that's why she pushed it back. And I believe that she did that in an attempt to keep Cassidy as president. So, and this is just my opinion, things that point in that direction, but I believe that this was an attempt to either try to keep Cassidy as president of the MNC in some type of way or someone else that they, that they can puppet master. And that, again, that's just an opinion. But we need leaders, because you're talking about Métis responsibilities, we need leaders that talk like what you're talking about. And you're talking about, you're doing this in a, in a non-paid capacity. Um, and, and there's people that are getting paid lots of money that don't have the courage to just speak truth to the people. And we need people like you in leadership positions. You know, I, I appreciate your comments, and there's a lot in that. I, You know, I'm not fully sure all that led to it. I, I certainly see that there was probably some fear in, in postponing elections. In June, myself, along with two other leaders in Southern Alberta, we made a complaint to the Métis Nation of Alberta, to Audrey, and we made one to the Mickey Judicial Council, basically saying that <clears throat> we felt under the Societies Act, and I'm, I'm going to say the Societies Act, but I'm going to also talk about the principles of a fair democracy, 
that there were big problems with postponing of elections. We felt like it was illegal, um, and we felt like it wasn't allowed, and we still feel that way. And so my council <clears throat> made an open statement after we didn't get a response from Audrey and those around her. We made an open statement in a press release. It's a barrier that you have to go through this Make Judicial Council <clears throat> to make your complaint. And when we made our complaint, you know, we really cited what we think are you know, principles of a fair democracy, like timely elections is a hallmark of a fair democracy. And so for someone who's been in power for 26 years to call with a group to postpone an election through a meeting that's held up in Grand Prairie, no offense to the people of Grand Prairie, but it's quite a distance, with just barely enough people there to have quorum, and then on top of it to call it to vote three times. It was like calling something to vote until you got the results that you wanted. And so we were concerned and, you know, and then I've taken the media route since, you know, there's been <clears throat> probably close to a dozen interviews through various media outside of the Métis community. This is, you know, provincial media basically to express that, you know, you, 199 people out of approximately 53,000 Métis citizens in Alberta, that's next to nothing in terms of who got to weigh in on that decision. And, you know, it's, in my opinion, it's an obvious contradiction to the rule of law. It is problematic, and I think that, you know, I have no other way to put this. I'm not trying to create a legal issue or to see my community further sidelined, but if we don't stand up as a community and call this what it is, we're going to see further things happen that marginalize our community. And so to me, it's a complete lack of democracy. I think it it's, uh, it's a display and a demonstration of weak leadership from Audrey Petra and those around her. Uh, and I've lost my confidence in the leadership of the MA for that action and, and things thereafter to do with the Constitution and, and the postponement of elections. I, you know, I, I agree with you too. And uh, being a Metis myself from Manitoba, uh, we have a, a, a similar issue that, in my opinion, I'm a firm believer in uh, leaders having term limits. You've got to get some fresh ideas, uh, fresh blood in there. You can't have the same old, same old. And I read about what you were saying about uh, Grand Prairie or whatever. I mean, so many people couldn't get there. So it's, in my opinion, it's like you're stacking the deck to, like you said, get the results that uh, you want that Audrey wanted. So where is the democracy in that? Or, I mean, you're, you're supposed to serve your people, not serve your own end goals. And, you know, we've had other people from Alberta reach out to us about uh, contacting the judici judicial arm there and they got nowhere. I don't know how you got in your process, but they actually got nowhere real quick because they said allegedly that Audrey has a hand in that other, you know, where you file your complaint in the judiciary side where she has a hand in that. So it's not really a fair uh, democracy for filing complaints. That's just alleged through uh, some other people from Alberta. Well, to your point, let me give you a bit of a breakdown as to what happened because I think it's worth flushing out. When we initially learned that, you know, that, that special meeting had passed a resolution that elections would be postponed, we filed a complaint immediately, me and two other leaders in Southern Alberta. And we went through this process of actually saying, you know, talking about the hallmarks of democracy, but, you know, the MA is governed by the Societies Act, and they make claims within their bylaws that, you know, they follow the Alberta Elections Act. And so, we made this complaint to the MJC, basically saying that, you know, there wasn't adequate notice giving, given and that this isn't fair. <clears throat> we got a response back from Audrey Petra saying that, you know, she treats her bylaws as a standalone document. And so the Elections Act doesn't apply because the Elections Act clearly stipulate the time for elections is set. That can't be changed unless it's by the Alberta Elections Officer. And so they took the position that, you know, that didn't, apply and when the MJC got back to us they conceded yeah there wasn't appropriate notice and and they said but our bylaws provide for if a decision is made without appropriate notice that can happen but they said very specifically this can be changed or basically reversed through a special resolution 
And so Jeanette Hansen, the leader out of Medicine Hat and myself, we put forward a special resolution for their assembly in August. It got sent to all members of the MA. They put that out fairly to say that this has been called for, and it was basically to make sure that elections happened. And during that meeting, a few problematic things happened. And I think the first of, they had um, a resolutions committee, I believe maybe being led by one of the MA lawyers. And they had said that, you know, they weren't going to put this to a vote after advertising and everything because the Métis Judicial Council had ruled that uh, against us. And yeah, they ruled against us, but they clearly stipulated, you know, this can be changed through special resolution. And so they just did this all out, in my opinion, administrative technique to pull it off the floor. And that was a problem just in terms of the way that they administrate and govern their meetings. The second issue that really came up in that meeting that was apparent to me is, look, I have, you know, a large local. There's probably about 4,000 Métis self-identifying in my area, 1,800 Carter members, give or take. Okay. We had elders and people sleeping two to a room to make it to Calgary. Now, we're not that far, but it's a multi-day event. Every member of the provincial council got a handful of rooms to hand out to people who they wanted to assign to be there. And so, yeah, there's a huge selection bias. If you're paying for the means for people to go and contribute and all the staff are paid, it really showed me that this is going to be difficult to change because, you know, I, I have... I have never had anyone in my community of Lethbridge reach out and say, you're doing the wrong thing when it comes to the m and uh, Or, you know, we need to back off on the Constitution. They've been solidly behind us. I have not had one person. And we got a really active, engaged membership. But if were they to hold a meeting today in Lethbridge, we'd have a protracted challenge because they're so mobile. They have, you know, the funds and the means for the funds to control the process. And so... It's hugely problematic, and that's one of the reasons that, with the Constitution, postponement of elections, we've taken it up to the federal government. In my view, and, you know, albeit that, you know, I'm at this ground level working with communities, there's not everything that I know about politics and the federal structure, a big part of the problem with the MA right now is that their funds have been increased probably about tenfold in the last five years. And with it has come very little expectation. We even went to the point where we made a request for information from the federal government as to their funding agreement. This group has over $100 million of a year. They have untold amounts around legal dollars, untold amounts around, you know, one-sided advertising for this proposed constitution. And really what it is, is it's making it tough for communities to have a voice. And so I don't have a lot of confidence and faith that Audrey Petrad and those around her are going to suddenly start to do the right thing. So I think that you know, part of our, our struggle has been to make sure that the federal government who's funding them know this is a problem for the communities. You know, they need to level the playing field. We'll take care of our own mess. We'll fix this through election. We just need to be able to have fair and free election. That's what I'm concerned about. And, and you know what? Uh, one of the things that we noticed over the years, because we, we've been doing this now over five years, and I, I can tell you that Audrey de definitely does not represent the Métis in Alberta on a large scale because she, yeah, she may be the uh, president of the MNA, and but there's a lot of Métis there that are not happy with her, that uh, want a new president, and there's a lot of Métis that are actually planning to leave the MNA if if Audrey c continues to stay president. Well, to your point, you know what I would agree with is that the part that's clear is I respect the office. I believe in having, you know, a, a strong Métis nation within Alberta and a strong Métis nation nationally. And I know that sometimes that can be looked at differently. I don't think the two things are antithetical. I think it can happen. But I have openly lost confidence in the ability of President Audrey Petrat to lead this community. Um, I lead my community, and uh, she leads this nation. I respect the office, but I have lost confidence. And I believe my council has, has concerns, and we've been open about it. You know, and it didn't, like I said, it didn't come to this day one where we started firing right away. It really developed where we try to work together on common priorities, find some compromise. But when that hasn't happened, then, yeah, we've gone all out. And part of my concern is that, and this is, again, something that you mentioned, 
regardless, you know, of what they do, you can win a vote that you paid for. You can have a constitution put forward, but you can't have a nation without people. And what I'm concerned about is I do see communities leaving. I see communities wanting to leave and working to leave. If the communities right now that were able to leave, if it wasn't, you know, I don't think it's simple to leave legally, but there's a strong desire for people to try and find ways to restructure themselves so that they can represent themselves. I have locals in my region that are closing down their offices. These are longtime locals with elders in these offices because they don't have access to this federal funding. It isn't trickling down, not, not enough. And we're being blocked with it. You know, it's a slap in the face when you see this large marketing of a vote yes campaign, you know, beginning in September. And I just think that, you know, if this is an aspiring government, they should have expectations of the people that they're electing to use these public dollars properly. It shouldn't be used towards one-sided messaging. It shouldn't be used towards controlling the process. And so for me, you know, people have been asking me, am I intending to run further? What am I doing? I want to stay right where I am at the local level. I'm not going anywhere. But I'm also not going to desist from what we've taken on, and that's to see changes in the m and So, you know, strongly in opposition to the way, the direction that Audrey has taken this community, that's where we are. But let me ask you this question, because th- th- therein lies the problem. If, if, if we don't have people that are transparent and will come out and talk and answer questions as president of the m and if we don't have these people, such as someone like yourself, that's willing to run for president, then where who who's gonna be the president? You see what I'm saying? Like, uh, there was there was somebody that uh, was gonna run, and then uh, he ended up dropping out. Uh, there's a lot of background noise on the reasons why, but uh, you know the fact that he dropped out, he dropped out. But the thing is, the the Métis people in Alberta want leaders that are transparent and will answer their questions and 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 let them know where the money's going. Like one of the things that you mentioned in this interview was that uh, they get a hundred million a year. I believe over a hundred million a year. And you know, that, you know what's interesting? In early in October, they had the first constitution session in that. We had written asking for constitution sessions. We had written asking for input. And we didn't get a sufficient response. The first constitution session they had, it was already set. There was no changes to be made. It was basically just to give the rationale for it. And I asked this question directly to the president, Andre Petra, about the funding. And, and a lot of what she had answered was that the constitution you know, it, it's a solution because so many of the problems that we're seeing, and they acknowledge there's deficiencies with the leadership in every region, where the president and the vice president aren't working together. So much of it she put down to funding and that going to a constitution would fix it. So I asked, you know, what funds are we talking about here? And she said the Alberta government had reduced their overall funding at one point and it's been stagnant, hasn't changed. And I told President Petra, I said, you know, that's a million dollars of funding. We're talking about the federal funding that you get, which is $100 million excess a year. That's not trickling down. And all we keep hearing is that this constitution is this, you know, solution, this magical solution that we can't see. And I asked her, can you tell us specifically how this is actually going to improve trickling down of funding, how it's going to improve governance? And I didn't get a clear answer. I even said, you know, I'll support you if you can just clearly articulate that. How is this going to create access to support for communities? We've never gotten a clear answer on it. And so, you know, for me, you can point all you want to say being under the Societies Act is a problem. Sure, I'd rather see us being self-governing. But the common denominator to our problem is someone who's been there for 26 years. Yeah. That's the unknown. <laughs> Amen. You're trying to say there's some solution that's unknown. And people, you know, and unfortunately some people being so well advertised or seen it that way, they need to come back and look and say, what are the knowns in the situation? And the knowns are common denominator of weak leadership. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you on that. And uh, I was in. And I think uh, for me too, Adam, I have a problem uh, in the first page, page one of uh, the letter, October 31st, 2022 letter to the Prime Minister, where you're saying that to date, 
uh, Minister Mark Miller had hadn't responded at all to multiple requests for consultation and information. Have you yet to receive any kind of con you know uh, correspondence from Minister Mark Miller? I have yet to get a response from Minister Mark Miller, but like I said, you know I'm not backing off. I you know at this point the audience isn't Audrey Pratt. The audience is Mark Miller and the federal government, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. They need to step in at this point. You have a significant number of locals in this province, especially in Region 3 and Region 4, that have expressed concerns openly and publicly. You know, you look at the populations of those two groups, that's 80 plus percent of the, May the Métis in Alberta. And they have reached out to Mark Miller requesting response. And so, I mean, the short answer to the federal government is you cannot use greed or weak leadership as a way to bypass our communities. We're still going to be here, even if this get, goes through and there's a yes vote, which likely will happen, we're still going to be here and they're going to have to answer. And there's going to be you know, the possibility of community leaving. There's the possibility of litigation. Uh, I'm not going to say where our next steps are, but we're certainly considering all options. Well, I will say this about Mark Miller, because uh, we, we, we got background information on a lot of different stories and stuff. And I guess it's been about a year, maybe a year and a half, somewhere in there where actually uh, he he actually did take up for the people in one conversation that he had with several uh, Métis leaders that were basically disrespecting the people. And uh, I do remember that conversation. So at that point, we, we, we felt like, okay, yeah, we have a lot of hope for Mark Miller. But then you hear all these conversations of where he's not responding to the people. And it's like, it's very uh, concerning and very disappointing for sure. But I know that one of the things prior to us talking was that uh, you were talking about building stronger communities. Uh, can you just list some, I guess, give some example, quick examples on how uh, that can be done, not just in Alberta, but any in any organization, what 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 do you see as a way to build stronger communities besides obviously have a transparency? Well, I think the first thing when I look at like communities, and I'm going to talk about it from the governance perspective. You know, we need more leaders to step up who are unpaid. You know, this provincial council, the Métis Nation of Alberta, they're all on the payroll. And they're actually fairly limited in the amounts they get paid. And I feel like, you know, this was a bylaw that was introduced under this current regime where people couldn't have other employment. You know, and I've, I've seen that weaponized and even used against people to try and suspend certain provincial council members if, you know, they had another job. I work full time for a school division, but I'm also a professor in the afternoon. I have to do that as part of my academic upkeep that I'm teaching or I'm regularly involved and I've just seen ways to sideline people. And so I think one of the best ways we can start building leadership at the local community level is to make sure we have active and involved locals. Whether you're in Alberta, whether you're in Manitoba, the more people that we have who are contributing to the leadership of their community in unpaid ways, like these are the people who can't be bought and can't be sold. That's the Ote Pemsuek, right. the ones who are not bought, the ones who are not sold. And so I think that, you know, part of what we need to do to establish trust with the community is be clear about uh, conflicts of interest, you know, and declare them. Every meeting that I have at the start of the meeting, we do, you know, our mitchiff word, we open with a blessing. But then we also, you know, have as a standing item any conflicts of interest. And we got weak conflicts of interest guidelines within the Métis Nation of Alberta, and I think we need to do that at a governance level. I think when it comes out to actual community level, we need to see people, we need to be in front of people. I'm in our office right now, and our staff is in for the day, but we're here. And it's not, you know, we just have an open door policy. If you have an open door policy, don't let the door hit you in the ass on the way out. You know, we need to get out there and be in front of community and be willing to answer questions, be willing to speak about what we believe in. And so I think a lot of what we need to do to start, you know, building our communities is leadership. I think the other thing we need to do is, I get it, people are afraid. They're afraid to speak out, but we need to get past that. You know, we've been in the position as a Métis nation in the past. You don't have to read much past 
you know, the Northwest is our mother from Jean to Lay to see just, you know, the effects of what weak leadership does versus strong leadership. And I think we need to have those expectations of, of our leaders. <clears throat> you know, when I look at the community level and that question about, you know, what does it take to build strong communities? Investments in our communities. You know, we've had recently in Southern Alberta large gatherings of a number of our leaders and our elders coming together so that we're making the same guidance. You know, we're looking at sharing resources. You know, the community is where my heart is, so I'm really passionate about, you know, what it looks like to build a community. When I moved to Lethbridge six years ago, I'm originally from Calgary. You know, I didn't know a ton of people, and then coming in here, I found out that I had family, distant really related, closely related, and then just like-minded Métis, and so it's really built that network in me. So very passionate about the communities. We need to be out in front of the communities. You know, I've seen from our head office and even from other Métis groups, fancy, flashy videos, posters, you know, maybe centralized programs, and I'm not sure it actually builds the type of cultural connection that we need. I'm starting to see that maybe less is more, just opportunities for communities to come together. I really think that at the grassroots level, that's where I see community building happen. You know, and it's difficult being Métis sometimes in Southern Alberta because you have, you know, a predominant group of First Nations, Black, you know, tribes, and there's not always been a space for Métis. I've seen since 2016 to 2021, and I'll brag about this all day long, my population has grown in self-identification by 31%. I don't think that's happened in other areas of the province. That starts with Métis people being proud of who they are. They gotta see themselves, they gotta make sure that they're comfortable, and they need someone who doesn't tiptoe around or who tries to put out fancy posters or speak to advertisements of the work. They actually need someone who's proud to stand up and say, this is the Métis homeland. Southern Alberta is the homeland of the Métis. We've always been here. We're always going to be here, regardless of what happens with the MNA. So we could have the whole world surrounding us. And then all I'd say to my group is, hey, this is just like the Tosh then. We're still going to be here. Well, can I ask you a question? Because I've kind of I've kind of been talking about this in the last couple of shows, and I really don't know how much has made it in the shows, to be honest with you. But I uh, I one of the things that I touched on was because we're talking about people who self-identify as Métis, right? Or we're talking about people that don't have genealogy. And all the reason I'm bringing this up is because there's a lot of attacks on people like. Okay, there's a lot of acceptance for some people that identify as Métis, but then the minute they fall out with somebody, all of a sudden they're long, no longer being called Métis and they're being attacked on social media. And so can you elaborate on how you view that and in, in your organization where you're at? That's a great question. It's a tough question. You know, when I, when I was speaking about our population growth and the self-identifying population, I was just talking about the Canada census. Um, and the reason I'm using that as a benchmark of where we're at as a community is I don't get accurate lists from the MA and it's a real struggle to get them, you wow. know, from our full membership list. And, you know, Lethbridge is a big growing municipality and, you know, our census data is showing this massive increase. But in the three years I've been here, I've got lists that show us and, you know, having a, a decrease in our population. And so we've had to really take advantage of software and other ways to track who's applying so that we can make sure that we're actually being reflected. You know, that conversation of self-identifying versus you know, the carded Métis recognized by the Métis Nation of Alberta, it is past my pay grade. You know, I'm Métis born and raised. You know, my mother, both of her parents were and all of my great grandparents. I'm strongly passionate about my culture. I'm passionate about our language. The people in my community are too. You know, we adhere to, I, I would like to make sure that we're not being watered down in our identity of folks who are not Indigenous, or maybe they're Indigenous, but they're they're diverse, but they're not our diversity. They're not Métis. Um, I'm concerned about that generally, but I deal less of it with less of it at the community level as a community leader. Okay. Um, well, I appreciate you explaining that a little bit on how you, how you view it. <laughs> but you know, I think Adam, like we we've had other people on our show from Alberta, and they seem to mirror some of the same concerns. Where, uh, you know, 
they have struggles where it seems that, uh, uh, you know, the president of the MNA, it's allegedly that uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, focus on trying to get rid of collective rights. And a lot of people in Alberta are deeply concerned about losing, uh, you know, their, the locals and losing uh, collective rights. And, uh, you know, so many people have expressed that to us that they figure if they get their card, they're just a colonial number and it's a numbering system where, uh, you know, the president where they can access the federal funding, what have you. But a lot of, like you've said in the interview, a lot of people are not getting the funding. So they're getting a big pot of money, but it's not trickling down to the locals. And you said just recently here that you have a problem getting lists and stuff from Audrey. It, again, there's a huge problem with really a lack of leadership with providing uh, the people in the communities uh, the tools that they need to to work with their people. And I, I completely agree with you. You don't need this flashy neon sign and all this blah, blah, blah. Uh, to, you've got to get down to the community level and be on the ground floor with people so they can relate to you and not relate to going to this hotel, this seminar, meals uh, paid for. I mean, that's not a, really a reality for, for, you know, the everyday Métis citizen. Absolutely. You know, this, this most recent attempt with this constitution, it's just the most recent attempt to encroach on the powers of locals and regions. For years, the MNA has been warring in court with their locals, you know, including most recently, they purported to represent all non-settlement Métis in Alberta. You know, you talked about that. But the Alberta Court of Queen's Bench clearly stated that their position was overbroad and they lost in court. You know, they're saying they're going to appeal. My method, you know, if I had to sum up everything that I'm about in, in a short, succinct method, it wouldn't be to them in any leadership because I have lost faith in them. You know, my message is to our people, and it's that, you know, we're a self-governing nation, and we're going to be created with the involvement and the voice of our communities and people. We can't achieve that through one-sided advertisements, neon song, purchasing results. An effective government begins by empowering its people. But we are that people. We are that government. And it doesn't have to be still that, you know, the m and leadership. I think there's a lot that we can do in our communities to educate ourselves about you know, the legal perspectives on the self-government government agreements, you know, reaching out to the federal government directly. If we don't get a response from Minister Miller, and I think we've got to be fair to give him some time in that response, but I would expect it to. If we don't get a response from Mr. Paul, then I think our next steps are going to be for our community, for each and every one of us to start writing them individually and to carry this on. I don't think we're going to be silenced very easily, and I think that the Métis have to to take that perspective. Yeah, I like how you put priority on the people and less priority on the uh, the self-serving of the uh, of some of the. Uh, I don't know the best way to explain it, but there's a lot of board members that are just self-servers, and uh, it, it really sucks. It really sucks for the people. But um, I'd imagine, my friend, that we're not the only indigenous group to deal with. That government has found a really effective way. It's the new colonialism where they can use the greed of weak leadership to, you know, not engage with us directly because we're a large group, and we're a powerful group. That's our home, people. You know, and so I see why they want to take shortcuts in dealing with folks who are less demanding, but maybe less less representative of who who we are. And I think well, we have to go back to the federal government and insist that, you know, well, you need to deal with us directly. Well, you know, I think a lot of these uh, uh, leaders, including Audrey in that, and I'm not going to name uh, a bunch of other leaders because this is my opinion, but I think a lot of these leaders are forgetting the basis, uh, basic uh, premise of Métis people were built on kinship and community. And uh, uh, that's the foundations of who we are as a Métis people, and I, I, you know, I think maybe Audrey and some other leaders should maybe spend time and sit with an elder and really maybe, maybe remember what it is to be a, a Métis 
person themselves and not really, in my opinion, again, a colonial puppet and uh, uh, serving Absolutely. themselves and yeah, not serving the people. You know, we have a saying in Mechef, uh Tekwashta, or Kekwai Takas Katakwashtak. And it's and it includes your people. That's what it means. That should be the basis of governance. And if they don't have that, you don't need to speak Michif to know that. But if they're missing that, then my message is beyond them. And I think that they're missing that. And so my message is to the people. I'm not running for anything. I'm doing this for free. I'm doing this for my community. I do this for our nation. And I'm going to continue to do it. But I'm not going to relent on it. Neither is my council or anyone in my community. We're here to stay. Well, let me just say this, and it's a shame that you're not running for anything because of the fact that you do put the people first and you, uh, you're you transparent. I mean, I, I just want the listeners to understand this. When, when, when we were talking about having you on the show, not at one time did you say, uh, what questions are you going to ask me? <laughs> you never asked us that. You, ne- you said, sure. You never asked what questions you were going to be asked. There's presidents that are sitting on other boards. Uh, they would ask us to send them a list, list of questions. They would look at it, and they would absolutely just refuse to come on because they didn't like the questions, right? And so, but basically, we're not used to structuring it where we have pre-planned questions, although I guess a lot of other media groups do that. We kind of just like to sit down and have a conversation like what we're doing with you. And uh, we just feel more comfortable doing that. Yeah, and I think that's where, you know, our leader should be is that not everything has to be planned or scripted or written by a lawyer or read off of a teleprompter or read off of a paper. Sometimes you just have to speak to the people. You know, I think a large part of the contribution I make and my council make, I'm lucky. You know, half of my council are educators, the other half are really culturally involved people. I have some artists, you know, it's that community level of engagement. So that's where I'm comfortable. Uh, you know, I have two two full time other jobs, uh, and and some dogs at home that I like to go hunting with, and so I enjoy that. That's my time off, and just connecting with our people. I've I've heard good things about your podcast. That was the only question I had. I wanted to understand who you both were, and so I had to do a little bit of reaching out. But I have nothing to prep for. You know, all of our answers are open. I try and be as factual as possible, uh, and the rest of it is you know my informed opinion. Well, let, let, and, and, and you brought up a good question there, like who we are. If you go back and actually listen to all of our shows, because a lot of people put out a lot of false information on who we are. We actually do a lot in the communities to help people out. Uh, we, we're, we're for the people. And so, but, you know, if we're not pushing somebody's political agenda and somebody gets butt hurt, but the minute that you're supporting the uh, something that could be th- these people's agenda it, it, because you're supporting it because you believe it is a good thing in some some cases then all of a sudden they love you so either the people are going to love you or they're going to hate you <laughs> and I, but i think the thing is about about us is that we love the truth and we love giving uh metis individuals a, a chance to to say what they want to say instead of it being censored critiqued I think our Métis people do deserve a voice, and we can disagree with people, but we should disagree respectfully because everybody should have a seat at the table. We're not going to agree with everybody. I mean, it's not a perfect world, but we should be able to debate respectfully. And I know years ago I reached out to Audrey because we were having an event to do with uh, uh, my great-great-uncle Cuthbert Grant Jr. We wanted her to uh, participate. And uh, she didn't even have the courtesy to, uh, she said she was going to respond and just didn't even bother to show up. So I just gave up trying to reach out to Audrey and, uh, you know, they're behind this uh, iron curtain or something like that where they're not accessible really to anybody unless it suits their personal or political agenda. And I think that's totally wrong. And I agree with you seeing that you should, doors open. People will have questions. I mean, people deserve answers. You know, there's a Métis leader in Alberta I was speaking to recently. She's one of the few people to stand up and actually, you know, confront things and call them what, call them what they are. She's a doctor in her field. She's got a PhD. She's well accomplished. But her greatest quality as a Métis leader is her sincerity. That's her greatest, you know, credential. And I think that Métis people 
we got pretty good BS meters. Yeah. And I've been seeing people reach out lately who are critical of people because, you know, you offended their allegiances in some way. And I think those two things, we need to separate from these weak allegiances, you know, because some people are part of a structure where they benefit in some way. And that's where that, you know, we need, let's be clear, let's call out our conflicts of interest and make sure that we, we uphold that so people have greater expectations that when we're serving, we're serving. You know, we're not serving with some side expectation. And then, you know, we're leading with sincerity. I think we should be able to answer people with straight questions. The moment we don't do that, then, you know, that's, we're neglecting who we are as a people. You know, and I'm incredibly disappointed at the lack of leadership and what I'm seeing from folks who are doing that. And, you know, I can just speak for myself as a leader and, and hold true to it. And I'd welcome anyone, anyone in my community, anyone you know, to come and say different. I'd always sit and open and listen and respond to anything. Any decision that I've made, you know, I'll stand behind. We've taken some actions, you know, and I put my own time, my own effort, my own talent and my own money in, you know, to make sure that we can support our community and stand behind what we say. Am I worried about legal ramifications? Slightly, but I'm a lot more worried about, you know, losing our community. And so, no, I'm going to keep on the same path. Yeah, and that's good, and that's why we need people like you in leadership positions. I mean, you 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 speak about all the qualities that a good leader would have. I just want to thank you for the opportunity to share this, and I want to thank those who lead around me. You know, I've got those pots of seven right now. It used to be slightly bigger, but from our elder to you know the Métis artist Carl Jerome, I got some incredible leaders. You know, incredibly strong women on my council. Paulson. There's a ton of people who've contributed to where my community is at. And so I'd be remiss if I didn't call them out. You know, we got great leaders. I, I'm, you know, while my overall message and sentiment was one of concern, there are leaders in our province still. You know, I can go up near Edmonton, I can look at Dr. Tracy Friedel, and I can say there's a leader in our community, someone who's not bought and sold. And so I still have hope, regardless of what happens with this constitution vote. You know, there's still an avenue for us to express where we're concerned and to be heard. And, and so I just want people who are listening to this to understand that, yeah, there is a plan going forward. You know, I don't want people to despair. There's a lot up against us. Hey, but that's who we are as Métis. We'll continue speaking truth to power. This October 31st uh, letter, so our, our, our listeners and viewers can, you know, read it at great length. And I, again, I would like to thank yourself and... Um, you have Elvin uh, Finley, m a Local uh, Council 1994, listed on the letter as well. And I think when we really think about uh, Métis leaders, and I think if you know you people uh, read about uh, Louis Riel and even Cuthbert Grant Jr., uh, what you're doing here mirrors what they did in the past by putting, fighting for the rights of their people and putting the people first. So I think you are doing what, you know, uh, the ancestors did in the past. And I think we need more of that within Métis communities that really fighting for people's rights. And uh, again, uh, you know, we'd like to thank you for your bravery and great courage for doing this uh, for the uh, Métis people of Alberta. And it sends a real loud message to Métis right across Canada that, you know, there is power in numbers and we can stand up and make a difference. You know, I, I know and I, I appreciate that. And thank you so much for the opportunity. And I see my two great grandfathers, Joseph Fandel and Donald Ross. I invite some of our other leaders. It's not our numbers, it's where we come from. Think about who you are, think about your ancestors and stand up. You know, Alvin stood up. I'm hoping some other leaders do as well. Thank you for taking your time. And anytime you want to come back on and talk about anything, please uh, just contact us and you, you have an open invitation. And if anybody else that you know wants to come on the show, just let them know. We're, we're not for one alliance, this alliance, that alliance. We're for the people. And so we're not, we don't hold hatred with anybody. We just want transparency and fair leadership. I've only heard good things. And I regret that I haven't heard you both of you before, but you reached out and I did my text and I got a good time. They said very really positive. I would have came on anyways. I appreciate it. I'll definitely be in touch. And thank you both. Okay. Thank All you right. very ha much. Ha have a good evening, Adam. Thank you. Thank you.
It would seem that uh, Adam has a lot of qualities that a lot of Métis leaders uh, today are lacking. So it's very refreshing to see somebody transparent. And as of the taping of this show, uh, November 8th, it was uh, Indigenous Veterans Day. So, and as well, November 11th is Novemberance Day. And another important thing is November is also Indigenous Disability Awareness Month. So a lot happening with Indigenous Métis people in November to make note of. And let's let's look at some key points that, that Dr. Adam Browning mentioned. Was the the seemingly non-transparent financials. They're having a hard time at one of the locals themselves getting an accurate picture of what the financials is. Mark Miller, if you're listening to this, you need to stop supporting leaders like Audrey Portress. What she did by postponing that election was wrong. It was wrong for her to do that to the Métis people in Alberta. It was uh, it definitely, the, it, we've not been contacted by one Métis in Alberta that thought that this was a good thing to happen, was that she uh, postponed the election. Why did she postpone it? You see obvious obvious problems with transparency. We're talking about a hundred million dollars a year that was mentioned in this interview. Where in the hell is all that money going? The M and A should be audited. I mean, what the hell's going on with all that money? And Métis people in Alberta, you sh this should really be alarming to you. As of the taping of this show, Minister Mark Miller had not responded to multiple requests for consultation and inf information from the Métis Nation of Alberta Association. Very, very alarming. And we're discussing uh, the October 31st, 2022 letter to the Prime Minister of Canada and the signatures are at the bo bottom of this letter is Dr. Adam Browning, MNA Local 2003, Lethbridge and Area Metis, and Elvin Finley, MNA Local 1994 of Grand uh, Couchet Mountain Metis. So those are that's the the letter that is bringing all this uh, controversy. And so there definitely needs to be somebody looking at what the hell's going on with the financials in the Métis Nation of Alberta. This is horrible leadership by Audrey. Horrible leadership. Not just by Audrey, but you. there's a few board members that need to be voted off their seats there at the Métis Nation of Alberta, and you got to put people in that's going to be transparent. The huge problem is, where in the hell is the money going? Mark Miller and you, you politicians out there, do you not see the game that these people are playing? Are you supportive of mismanagement of tax dollars? Because these organizations get money. And as you just heard him say, Dr. Adam Brown say, it's not making it down to the locals uh, for the most part. So where the hell is the money going? Is it going on trips? Is it going on dinners? This would be what we view as a mismanagement of funds. And this is a lady that's real close to Cassidy, the president of the MNC. You see them in pictures all the time. It de definitely appears that they are close. Is is Audrey mentoring Cassidy to be just like her? Because again, where in the hell is the MNC financials? Where Where's that MNC transparency? I mean, there's, there's a huge concern here. How in the hell can you screw your people over? And it's important that many people in Alberta, Adam included, are opposing the Métis Nation of Alberta Constitution in its current form. And uh, they have been consistently clear in expressing concerns to the federal government regarding the Métis Nation of Alberta governance. And uh, it's very, very alarming that, uh, again, they're saying that uh, the Constitution was developed using a highly deficient process, and they see it uh, uh, barely disguised power and asset grab. And it's these politicians supporting this behavior from people sitting on the board. If they don't see that there's a huge problem with that election getting pushed back, if these politicians do not see that there's a huge issue with a lack of transparency, if these politicians don't see what Cassidy's doing at MNC also 
mirrors these problems uh, that these other leaders who's been on the boards for years and years. And, and, and we're going to be following this closely because we definitely need transparency for the Métis in Alberta. We definitely need good leadership there. And you do not have good leadership with Audrey. As long as Audrey's the president of MA, there is no good leadership there. She is not a good president for the MA. And it's about time Audrey and all the other leaders uh, work for the people not for themselves. You're supposed to be serving the people, not serving yourself. And it's very, very alarming. Uh, we will be keeping a close eye on what's happening with the Métis Nation of Alberta. Uh, updates on this letter to the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and asking the question why Minister Mark Miller has refused, have not even given any kind of response, reply, anything. No, they, they like for tax dollars to be used to intimidate the Métis people of not just Alberta, but let's look at the Métis Nation of, as a whole. How, how many leaders have used Métis, ta Métis money, the tax dollars, to go against the people in many situations? This has happened. How, how many people have used this money to go for trips, for fine dining, for whatever, right? It, it's just not in Alberta. It's across the board. So I know a lot of you are going to hear that this show is about Alberta and you may say, oh, yeah, I don't really want to listen to it. But actually, if you listen to Dr. Adam Browning, the qualities for building a stronger community and having good leadership really applies to any organization. And so I would highly encourage anyone, uh, no matter where you live, if you're in Alberta or not, to actually listen to that interview uh, with Dr. Adam Browning, because it, 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 it it's, it's, yeah, he's speaking truth, man. He's speaking truth about what a good leader, the qualities of a good leader should have. And the fact that I think a large number of people agree, agree that Audrey is a horrible president in the Métis nation of Alberta. Now, one person has contacted us to support Audrey Portress. Um, and that speaks volumes, volumes. Not one person has contacted us to support. Audrey Portress and say that she was a good president at all. Yeah. And again, the federal government, Justin Trudeau, Mark Miller, you just can't throw millions and millions of dollars at these Métis organizations and not have transparency and accountability. And when you have locals uh, stepping forward to say that the funds are not trickling down to the locals, that would be an eye opening. I mean, that should open your eyes. What's going on? You just can't. Like again, shove a bag of money at somebody and say, there you go, go off on your way. What about the transparency and the accountability to the people? That's it for me. Take care.